Good evening everybody welcome to this evening episode of pursue and we are starting pursue 11 and that's pursue 11a which is endocrine pathology we are streaming live from ipg mer kolkata and today we have two special people the moderator as well as the speaker both are very special let me introduce the moderator we have dr divya mitha who is a post graduate in pathology a pdf in oncopathology from Tata Medical Center. She is a senior consultant in the Department of Oncopathology with multiple publications and indexed national and international journal. Uh, an expert in neuropathology, <laughs> gynae pathology, and soft tissue tumors. Before I ask uh, Dr. Uh, Medha to take over, let me request all of you to please keep your mic muted. Please don't share your screen and please keep your camera off. With this, let me request uh, Dr. Divya, ma'am, please take over and introduce the speaker and start the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for having me again. It is indeed a great pleasure to moderate the session on slide-oriented discussion of adrenals, uh, space-occupying lesions, a case-based learning. This is being presented by Dr. Uttara Chatterjee. Madam is the Professor of Pathology, IPGMER, Kolkata, and a very well-known pathologist and teacher of pathology in our country. And personally, I'm a huge fan of hers. Madam did her post-graduation from Ames, New Delhi. She trained in pediatric pathology at St. Mary's Hospital, Manchester, UK. She has more than 150 publications in international and national journals and has contributed to several book chapters. Madam is the life member and the executive committee member of Pediatric Pathology Association. She is a member of the IAPM, the IAPID, the Indian Aca International Academy of Pathology Division, the Pathology Society of India, Indian Society of Neuro-Oncology. Madam is a member of the National Editorial Board, Internal of Pathology and Microbiology, and her research interests include pathology. Over to you, Madam. Right. Thank you, Lydia, for those kind words, and thank you, Dr. Nadeem, for inviting me here. So I start now. Just by presenting, just press present now on the right side of the screen. Uh -huh. Then your entire screen. Right. And press in the center of the screen and press share. Share and. always available. So then what you, what is available is inidin, melon A and calvitinin. The three of them together are very good. Inidin unfortunately has a sensitivity much lower, about 70%, 75%. Specificity very, very high. And melon A, calvitinin. So if you add melon A and calvitinin and do all three together, then you reach a sensitivity of over 90%. Melon A is also very good. Because in our part of the world, metastatic melanoma is very, very rare. But otherwise, in a Western population, yes, melanoma, the problem is to differentiate from metastatic melanoma. Calretinin also, when you add it to some, calretinin is a bit non-specific. But then if you add these three together, it's very good. Vimentin, cytokeratin, yes, vimentin usually is positive, like I showed you in this case. IGF-2 is another very, very good stain, but that's more of a translational, uh, that's more at a research level, but it's a very good diagnostic and prognostic mark marker. And I want to stress to you that synaptophysin is positive in half the cases of adrenocortical tumors. Now, just to show you cases, this is what now SF1 is a nuclear stain. It's a beautiful, new, crisp nuclear stain, stains almost everything. Unlike inibin, inibin which is more readily available, it has a lower sensitivity, it's a bit patchy. It doesn't stain all the cells, but there it is. It's a cytoplasmic and it is less uh, sensitive than the SF1. Now, 
Now, one of the things you always have to keep in mind when you're looking at an adrenocortical tumor is a metastatic or, um, or an infiltration from a renal cell carcinoma lying next door. So this can be very, the, histologically, they look almost the same. So here comes your immunos. You could do an SF1 if you have it or inhibin, calrigin, and melanin in whatever combination. Along with that, if you do EMA and CD10, that should be good enough to differentiate the two lesions which look so similar. So next, once you've made up your mind, it's adrenal. Next, we come to this question. Now look at this. A FEO versus an adrenocortical tumor. Now I've shown you these two. One is a FEO, one is an adrenocortical tumor. They both look very similar. Both have a nested pattern. Both have basophilic cells. Both have uniform nucleoli, uh, uniform nuclei with barely discernible nucleoli. They both look very similar with a packeted appearance. But one is an adrenocortical tumor and one is a pheochromocytoma. And as I said, this is the commonest mistake when you, this is the commonest uh, reason for a major mistake as far as adrenal tumor is concerned. Now, just make up your mind and I'm going to show you the gross. Actually, the gross is far easier than the micro to interpret. Now, that's the gross. Now, it's clear as daylight that the upper one is a pheochromocytoma. You can see the yellow cortex in the periphery. And this is a adrenocortical tumor. The yellow areas, the brown areas. This is where you have your lid rich cells, lipid-laden cells, and this is the FEO. So now when you go back, yes, the first one, the top one is a pheochromocytoma, and the bottom one is an adrenocortical tumor. I'll show you this case. I'll show you this particular case as I, as I go along. So to differentiate FEO and adrenocortical tumor, they have a lot in common. Synaptophysin, neurofilament, neuro, the neuron, um, uh, uh, neuron-specific enolase, they are all common in both, and synaptophysin is positive, in, as I said, in 50% of the cases of adrenocortical tumors. Now, why is it? Is it just because they are lying next door? There is it, it, does it rub off from the medulla? What is it? But, you know, studies have shown that these adrenocortical tumors can have membrane-bound neurosecretory granules. They have mRNA for synaptophysin. So it's not that it's just rubbing off from the neighbor. So they are they can show some sort of neuroendocrine differentiation. I guess it's something like the MINEN, or if you can have MINEN and the MANEC in the GI tract, you can have carcinoma with neuroendocrine differentiation. And these cortical tumors, maybe they also show some, some, some amount of neuroendocrine differentiation. But to come back to the question of FEO versus adrenocortical, it's chromogranin, which never comes positive in the adrenocortical tumor. So chromogranin is the reliable one here. And SF1 inhibin, which also does, should not, which will never come positive in the pheochromocytoma. So, you know, this pheochromocytoma versus adrenocortical tumor, you think that it's a joke, but um, the, the, how, how can that be? But it happens very, I have seen three cases myself, and I'd like to share this with you, that three cases I have seen of adreno, you know, of adrenocortical tumor, where the, where the patient, uh, um, where the clinician sent this to me, as a, as a pheochromocytoma and uh, just and keep it, and keep this in mind that both pheochromocytoma and uh, Cushing both can have hypertension and even a Cushing's can have marginally raised metanephrines. So even now, so this in this particular case, the clinician sent half to me and half elsewhere and elsewhere who did the immunos, uh, elsewhere where the immunos were done, it turned out to be synaptophysin positive. However, Later on, I showed that it's inhibin positive, and the clinician goes, I, even today, three years after diagnosis, he keeps asking me, are you sure that was an adrenocortical and not a fear? The, the patient has hypertension, you know. So this is what happens. This is what happens. It, it happens, uh, the, the, these cases. That common hypertension, marginally raised metanephrines, it's sometimes very, very difficult. And it's particularly difficult in cases where there's less lipid and you have a nested pattern. I'll, I'll come back to that later. Okay, and even this is a case with eosinophilic globules, and even and even the eosinophilic globules are not are not uh, seen in uh, in pheochromocytoma alone. This is a case of an adrenocortical carcinoma with eosinophilic globules. Okay, so once you've excluded METs, once you've excluded pheochromocytoma, let's talk about the cortical tumors, and I'll do the adenomas and the carcinomas together. So just a few words about the epidemiology. One is the fifth decade and below 10. But in, in addition to this, 
in uh, there is another age group that's 15 to 25 women between the age of 15 to 25 who come with endocrinopathies for example oligomenorrhea amenorrhea hirsutism virilization so that's another age group and definitely it's three times more common in women than in men about half are functional and for some curious reason about um, the incidence in southern Brazil is 10 to 15 times higher than the rest of the world. They have a peculiar TP53 mutation, which is different from the leaf from any. It's this R337H mutation, which sort of makes them more develop this tumor far more often than in other part of the world. But we won't go into that. Now, these are the, uh, now, um, these are the hereditary syndromes which are associated with higher incidence, which are which can be associated with adrenal cortical carcinomas, of which the most important one. For uh, IGF-2 gene. Now, I just want to stress to you that even in 90% of the sporadic So this is where shared common molecular pathway of the familial and the sporadic tumors, that is IGF-2 overexpression. So now we come to this very important thing. So whenever you're dealing with an adrenocortical tumor, you must have the entire, uh, entire hormonal profile with you. Once you have the hormonal profile, the size and weight, half the diagnosis is made. It does follow a very regular pattern. So let me stress to you that Hyperaldosteronism alone, it's only seen in adenomas. You never find an aldosterone secreting carcinoma. Pure aldosterone secreting carcinoma doesn't happen. If there is aldosterone secreting carcinoma, it's along with Cushing's, it's along with something else. It's always a mix. Similarly, a feminizing one is also always a carcinoma, the other end. The other end is the feminizing one. In so many years, I've seen only one case of feminizing 20 years ago. This was a little girl with precocious puberty, bleeding PV. Uh, but this was a 20 years ago case. She did not do well. So feminizing tumors, always malignant. And pure hyperaldosteronism, always benign, always adenoma. Cushing's half and half. Cushing's half adenoma, half carcinoma. Then you have, you have a mixed Cushing and virilizing, again, 99% it's a carcinoma. So the mixed tumors are all carcinomas. Virilizing is usually 70% of the virilizing tumors alone are also carcinoma. Very rarely you have the virilizing adenomas. And with this in mind and the gross, the hyperaldosteronism, the bright orange color, the Cushing has its yellow brown color virilizing, you know, that meaty color. So with this in mind, then you must go on to the rest of the. So just to show you some clinical pictures, this is a little boy with precocious puberty. A little boy, this is a girl with, again, uh, virilizing symptoms, clitoral hypertrophy, acne. This is a young girl, a 14-year-old girl with Cushing's. So always read the clinical picture or look at the endocrine, look at the hormonal level, the cortisol, the TRS, that is dehydropy For example, the half, there are nine things, there are nine systems, scoring systems, which I've enlisted of Poland, P, Helsinki, Weiss, Modified Weiss, Weinicke, Lin, Weiss, half. So this only goes to show that not a single one is perfect. This, uh, the best one is yet to evolve. Right. So one of the first ones was this half system of differentiating adenoma versus carcinoma. Now this included, in addition to histological, a lot of non-histological, like the tumor mass, the gross, urinary 17 ketosteroids, response to ACTH, uh, Cushing's with virilism, weight loss, everything. 
and this was replaced by the vans lutein which is very very good it has 100% uh, concordance with the vibes only thing is it's a little tedious and a lot of sums to do a lot of multiplication and addition and that's what you know is it's it's not easy on a daily basis to remember and do the sums so then comes the most widely used the wise criteria this is my favorite slide in this entire presentation this is wise in pictures this is wise criteria there are nine criteria so for symmetry i have put eight pictures and i put the mitosis and atypical mitosis together in this so there are nine criteria in this each one has one point so you have you can have 0 to 9 and just add them up so anything with more than 3 is considered as adrenocortical carcinoma 0 1 and 2 being uh, adreno being adrenocortical adenomas a uh, why so many uh, uh, why do we need to look at so many parameters in for example in thyroid uh, follicular neoplasm you're only looking at capsular and vascular invasion you can look at nine points like this now this is because no single parameter is sensitive enough to distinguish between an adenoma and carcinoma no single parameter so you need all these nine parameters in fact when vice formulated this he initially kept it at more than four to be malignant then it was found that of some cases of three also showed metastasis so he later on lowered his own criteria from uh, from 4 to 3 so now it's three or more as malignant now this has been shown now there are nine points here each one of these has been weighed out and it has been found that after weighing them out which are the most important ones so the most important ones amongst these it has been seen is the necrosis mitosis more than 5 per 50 high power field and the vascular invasion these are the most important points and it is seen that in the so many classifications that are there mitosis and necrosis and vascular invasion are there in practically all the uh, in all the scoring systems that are available okay then there is another so this is the, then came the modified vice where the, the total number is 7 and again more than 3 is considered malignant which and this also includes the mitosis and the necrosis and vascular invasion but there are limitations of vice obviously one size doesn't fit all and it can be it was seen that the, there are some variants like the oncocytic variant the myxoid variant the sarcomatoid variant so it is difficult to apply the vice criteria to these variants for example the oncocytic it over diagnoses oncocytic carcinoma especially and i said that as i had told you that there's a peak 0 to 1 0 to 4 years so in these pediatric patients using wise tends to over diagnose carcinoma over adenoma so then came another this is a very popular uh, thing the destruction of reticulin framework algorithm this was suggested by volanti so this is a very very simple thing to do it's just a histochemical stain you do a reticulin stain and if the reticulin framework is disrupted in over one third of the lesion or you can take it as fraying or thickening fraying or thickening over one third of the lesion that is considered as disruption of reticulin framework along with any one of the three important feature mitosis necrosis venous invasion so you need to have this disruption of reticulin framework and any one of these to make a diagnosis of carcinoma now this has 100% concordance with the vice scoring method and it has a sensitivity and specificity many you know plant study well plant studies have shown that this has a sensitivity and specificity of almost 100% of course some people have suggested that instead of reticulin if you have you could do a ihc against laminin or or collagen 4 but if not if you don't have ihc to uh, which which, uh, which uh, in my department i don't have then just a reticulin stain is very good okay then we come to the pediatric adrenocortical neoplasms where i said the biological behavior contrast morphologically similar tumors in adults so this is shown very well in this article by by denner which reads adrenocortical neoplasms in children why so many carcinomas and yet so many survivors now he found that in a study of about 100 patient 90% I 
AHC and the clinical pathological features of 83 patients of adrenocortical neoplasms in pediatric and came up with another set of criteria. So what they retained in vice is the capsular invasion, uh, atypical mitosis, necrosis and venous invasion. So the last three I told you are very important. These have been retained. What has not been retained is the diffuse architecture, 23%, well, less than 25% clear cell and in pediatric patients, the weight and size are very important. So what has been included instead is 400 weight, more than 400 grams. Size, more than 10.5 centimeter. Mitosis, look at the amount of mitosis that's allowed. In the adult white, in the vice, in the standard vice criteria, it is five mitosis per 50 high power field, which you're counting as one point in the vice criteria. And here it is more than 50 mitosis per 20 high power field. And look at the weight. So a lot more size a lot more weight and a lot more mitosis is allowed in the pediatric neoplasm. They tend to be much bigger. And if you think of it, the fetal cortex tends to be cytomegalic anyway. The cells are much larger. And perhaps these neoplasms in infants could be derived from the fetal cortex and they tend to be much larger than the adult tumors. Another thing is that in this Weinicke criteria, unlike the wise where there's only uh, carcinoma and adenoma here there's our favorite an intermediate category or some something like an atypical adenoma so there's an intermediate category less than two is benign if you get a score of three it's intermediate more than three is malignant so there is an intermediate category suggested here but remember the size and weight are very very important in case of the pediatric tumors and in our own study of you know about 13 patients we found that there is a discrepancy between Wynicke and Weiss when you apply to the pediatric patient. And we also found that KI67 is very, very useful marker to differentiate the adenoma versus carcinoma. And we further found that IGF2 is a highly sensitive marker of malignancy in pediatric patients. It's also in adults patients. And it shows this IGF2, this is SF1, the crisp nuclear staining and IGF2. This, it's not a brown blush that you're looking at in IGF2. It's this kind of paranuclear half, you know, it, it accumulates in the Golgi. And so you get this paranuclear half, this paranuclear staining, dot like thing. This is a very specific staining of IGF2, very specific, uh, and it is specifically shown and it can very uh, specifically distinguish uh, carcinoma versus, uh, versus IGF2. But of course, IGF2 is not available readily to us. It's still at a translational level. So with this in mind, I go on to my cases. I'm going to show 10 cases. So this is the first case. This is a 25-year-old lady with hypertension, muscle weakness, cramps, one paralytic episode. She was hypertensive, low potassium, low, and she had hypokalemia. And the CT scan showed a nodule in the right adrenal, which was taken out. Here I've seriously sectioned it. And you see this two centimeter bright orange nodule, canary yellow. Straight away, this is a, this is a, um, you think of an aldosterone secreting adenoma in this case. Look at this bright orange color and this is what it looked like. This is the remaining cortex. This is the, this is the tumor and this is the rest of the cortex. Now, if you look at it carefully, the rest of the cortex is not at all atrophic like you expect, like you get in the Cushing's adenoma. In Cushing's adenoma, the ipsilateral uh, cortex and the contralateral cortex are both atrophic, but not so in case of the aldosterone ones. It, in fact, it could be hypoplastic like this. And the cells are sort of clear, clear cells, and they are slightly, they are hybrid between the glomerulosa and the fasciculata cells. So, you know, they are larger than the glomerulosa cells, but smaller than the fasciculata cells full of lipids over here, right? Full of lipids. And you don't need to vice score this one at all. It will be zero by nine. I told you they're always adenomas. And this is another case of an aldosterone adenoma in a 30 year old male who presented with hypertension. But here, what I want to show you is that they can be very small. So small that, you know, sometimes only a centimeter or less. So a centimeter, so you need to transversely section them like very fine sectioning so that you don't miss that little nodule. And this patient 10 years, this is a 10 year old case. So this patient was treated with spironolactone and you can see the spironolactone bodies. And that can be there both in the tumorous portion. Uh, it, it, sometimes it's more in the non-tumorous portion as you see here. 
It can be there in the tumorous portion, but it can be there in the non-tumorous portion. Here are the spironolactone bodies surrounded by a halo. Yet another case of a bright yellow uh, aldosterone secreting adenoma and about 50% uh, per 60 percent of them are associated with mutations of KCN5 gene. Now this is associated, this is a potassium transporter and the ones with KCN5 mutation tend to be a little larger, more severe hypertension than those which do not. Okay. So with this, I go on to the Cushing's one. So now let me, I've shown you three cases of, I've shown you three cases of aldosterone secreting uh, adenoma. So now I'm going to show you the non-aldosterone secreting adenomas and the carcinoma. So now I'm going to show you, so this is, this is, um, this is a collage of three cases of adenomas. So I, the cross, you, it's very, you, this one, there was rupture during uh, operative, um, uh, during, uh, during operation, there was rupture. So, but this is also very uniform looking. Note that no necrosis. Look at this one. This is the same one. No necrosis at all. It's meaty, fleshy, pink in appearance. This one also. It's uniform in appearance, the adenoma, as compared to the gross of these four, this collage of four carcinomas. The carcinoma, look at the necrosis here. There's necrosis here as well. And look at this coarse nodularity. And this coarse nodularity is very, this, this anybody can say that this is a carcinoma. But in this one, look at the coarse nodularity here, the coarse nodularity here. This coarse nodularity is very, very typical of the adrenocortical carcinomas. This was a mixed one. See, this is a meaty in appearance, very meaty. And this is a virilizing carcinoma. And this was a mixed pushing and virilizing one. This also, I think, was a mixed one. And this was a non-secretory one, as far as I remember. So let's look at some Cushing's now. This is a baby, six months old baby with Cushing's and she had raised cortisol. Her TRS was normal. There was no virilization. The TRS level was absolutely normal. And this is what her tumor looked like. Very uniform. But the size is a little larger. Just remember in adults, whenever you find a Cushing's more than 100 grams, be very wary. Take multiple sections to rule out a carcinoma. But in case of a baby, as, as I told you, more weight and size is allowed. In any case, so four centimeter, 130 grams, and this is what the microscopy looked like. And this is the case, and this is exactly the case I showed you as a teaser. This is the case I showed you as a teaser with the pheochromocytoma. So look at the nested pattern. It's very nested. A uniform nuclei, uniform. Uh, the only so if you were to wise code this one. The only point that you can get is lack of 25% clear cells. So that would make it one out of nine wise, which is absolutely benign. And the reticulum is beautifully preserved in this case. And here it is. So this is a cortisol secreting adenoma. And this is the child after six months. She's done, not after I think two, three months. She's uh, pushing and everything is gone. Uh, as I told you in the, in the aldosterone secreting adenoma, you can have PCN mutation. Here there are activating, activating mutations of protein kinase A in about 40% of the cortisol secreting adenomas. Okay, then you can have some morphological variations. You can have morphological variations in the adenoma in the form of lipoadenoma, myelolipoadenoma. So this is a Cushing's uh, lipoadenoma. You can have a lot of fat here, but that's of no significance. You could even have a myelolipoadenoma. There's an entity known as a black adenoma, I'm yet to see one, where you have a lot of lipofustin. But there's no black carcinoma. But black adenoma, lipoadenoma, myelolipoadenoma are just variations on the adenoma. So now I'll show you another case of a Cushing's. This is my fourth case. This is a, that was a six months old girl with Cushing's adenoma. This is a 16 year old girl with Cushing's. Her cortisol levels were raised. TRS was normal, so it's a single hormone secreting. Rather big, 170 grams and 6 centimeter. Because it was 6 centimeter, it ruptured during taking out. So here it is. It's brown in color. And if you look at the microscopy, beautiful capsule. Okay, beautiful capsule, diffuse architecture. There's, there are no clear cells. No mitosis, no capsular invasion, venous invasion, no atypical mitosis. Uh, no high nuclear grade, the, all the nuclei look the same more or less. So I would say that 2 out of 9, which makes it benign, really, doesn't it? 
so it is lack of clear cells and a uh, loss of the uh, loss of the packeted appearance or the loss of nesting sort of diffuse architecture so this is why two out of nine but yet it is 170 grams and i decided to do a reticulin stain which definitely shows lack of reticulin staining rupture of the uh, disruption of the framework in more than half the slide the ki 67 was very 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 low so what do you do about these cases now if you go back i'm getting two out of nine now if you look carefully i searched and searched and i decided to call these nuclei maybe forman grade three focally focally so let's call this a carcinoma then much to the displeasure of the clinician who kept saying but madam this is a single hormone secreting so don't get lured into that the pure pushings can half the pure pushings are carcinoma and half the pure pushings are adenoma so you can i want to stress to you you can have a pure pushings carcinoma pure pushings are not always adenomas and this was true but much 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 later i did an igf2 on this case which shows that beautiful paranuclear staining now as far as the so i did call this an ad adrenocortical carcinoma low grade the ki 67 is very low less than five percent which and the uh, and as far as grading is concerned which is done by mitosis more than 20 per 50 hyperfield or less than 20 this was far less than 20 per 50 hyperfield so low grade carcinoma she does not need mitotain but just a, but but just a follow-up but this is to stress to you that there are these borderline cases which you can't fit into any category so there will be cases like this which are difficult to fit into any category and this is where the problem comes and because as of now there is no borderline or an uncertain malignant potential category so with this let's look at another cushings now cushings this is uh, this is another man with cushing 60 year old man with puffiness abdominal obesity bipedal edema the tumor is about six centimeters and weighs 200 grams now in this case both tears and cortisol are raised it was so big that half of it was sent in a bowl so you had to weigh the two together so there it is uh so let's look at this there is necrosis here one by nine and if you look at this lack of clear cells straight away two by nine diffuse a diffuse pattern three by nine look at the look at the high nuclear grade four that would make it four by nine sometimes these adrenocortical carcinomas can have a very very high this is from a different case but just to stress to you how bad the how, how bad they can look these monster looking cells sometimes they can look as bad now let's go back to my case there was capsular invasion five by nine so this is straight away a carcinoma which is there, there was of course disruption of reticulin framework the KI67 was rather high, so this is a mixed virilizing and pushing adrenocortical carcinoma, high grade where the mitosis was more than 20 per 50 high power field. So this is a mixed one. Let's look at another virilizing one. This is a 17 year old girl who came with oligomenorrhea, hirsutism, a deepening of voice, loss of scalp hair and a lot of acne. Her TRS was raised, testosterone is raised, cortisol levels were normal, 6 cm, 200 grams, just like the previous case. The previous case was also 6 cm, 200 grams. This is also 6 Look how meaty it is. Actually, the sex steroids uh, secreting uh, tumors tend to be larger and more brown in color. So this is what, if you look at this diffuse architecture, straight away, 1 by 9. Here you can find high nuclear grade again two by nine there is necrosis here three by nine so this is a virilizing carcinoma so virilizing the pure virilizing adenomas are quite rare i show you another virilizing tumor and the ki67 was also quite low so i would call this a low grade adrenocortical carcinoma and this is a pure virilizing one another virilizing tumor this is a one-year-old baby with precocious puberty uh, he had look at his muscles the you know three people needed to hold him to take a blood sample for the testosterone and the androstereone levels he was he had so much of muscle power in him at that point so this tumor if you look at it look at the necrosis a meaty appearance and look at the necrosis i've shown you this before when i showed you a collage of four cases of adrenocortical 
carcinomas. So there, th th this is what it looks like. So necrosis straight away, you've got one out of nine. So here, if you find there's a diffuse pattern, two by nine, high nuclear grade, three by nine, four by nine, there is a atypical mitosis here and sort of capsular invasion, I would call that a five by nine, right? So by Weiss criteria, so it's a five by nine. But if you, are, uh, if you use the Wynicke or the pediatric one, then it's much lower because, you know, size and weight are far below 400 grams and 10.5 centimeters. There is atypical mitosis. Then there is tumor necrosis and capsular invasion, which puts it into this 3 by 9 or an intermediate category. So this is what Dana refused to uh, refer to as the virilizing atypical adenomas. So it is important because what do you do here? Do you treat with mitotain, which is a very, very, so do you give radiotherapy in a baby? Do you treat with mitotain in a baby, which is very, 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 very toxic? This child after resection was followed up and he is doing very well. It's five years now since well, more than five years and this child is absolutely fine. But this is just to show you the discrepancy between the two scorings. That's what I'm trying to stress to you. Now, we have another case here of a 40-year-old 40, uh, 40 lady. She had no endocrine symptoms at all. She came with abdominal fullness, dragging pain, huge mass, right, with extra adrenal extension. You can see that it's come out piecemeal, and she had liver meds. It's a huge tumor, 12 centimeter and 600 grams. This is what it looks like. It doesn't even look like adrenal, doesn't it? There are these cells here which are pretty low, which show low nuclear grade. And here there's plenty of myxoid material, extracellular myxoid material, which is sort of filling up the whole slide. And of course, there was extra adrenal extension, this capsular extension here, as you can see. This is a alcyon blue stain and this entire extracellular myx myxoid material. It's pretty, isn't it? The alcyon blue stain, it looks so pretty. So here it is, the alcyon blue stain. And in a case like this, you can have a lot of retroperitoneal myxoid neoplasms. So I would straight away, I would do an inhibin on this. And inhibin here it is. It's inhibin positive. Surprisingly, it's a little bit synaptophysin positive. I told you that 50% of the adrenocortical tumors can show synaptophysin positivity. In my experience, it's less than 50%, but they can show patchy positivity. But there's a strong inhibin positivity here. TI67 is quite low. So this is a myxoid adrenocortical carcinoma. There are some there are some variants. I told you there are some morphological variants, the myxoid, the sarcomatoid, and the oncocytic. So these myxoid variants, they tend to do much worse. They're, the Y score tends to be low. There is not much mitosis here. But however low the Y score may be, the myxoid ones don't do very well. So there are not enough case reports, there are not enough series of myxoid tumors. So in whatever myxoid tumors, I will just show you one or two more um, articles on this. But I want to share with you one more myxoid tumor in a baby. This is a six months old with a huge mass, completely non secretory The myxoid ones, they again, tend to be non-functional. So this was the tumor. You can see a tail of adrenal here and here is the tumor. This is what it looks like. Look at the myxoid material, the strong alcyon blue and the pseudo glandular pattern that you can see here. So um, this is a myxoid adrenal adenoma and the, applying the Weinicke, nothing is present. There's no extra adrenal extension. There's no vena cava extension. There is no capsular venous or vena cava extension. Mitosis is absolutely zero. So I call this an adenoma after a lot of, um, uh, after a I was scared in calling this an adenoma because it's myxoid, but it's seven years now, child is doing very well. And I like to stress to you that myxoid tumors are usually seen in adults. They are non-functional. The proportion of myxoid stroma can vary from 10% to 90%. Both these cases are over 90% myxoid stroma, but a few reports show that myxoid is associated with aggressive behavior and the malignant potential of these tumors is not clear. So in this article, adrenal cortical tumors with myxoid features a distinct phenotypic variant exhibiting malignant behavior. So this was 14 cases and all adults. And here is my case, the, uh, the adenoma in a child and unusual morphology. So other than myxoid, you can have, this is my only book picture here. I, I'm, I'm yet to see a case of oncocytic. 
there's one more variant, the oncocytic variant. Now, the oncocytic variant tends to be larger. And for obvious reasons, the WISE criteria tends to overdiagnose because there are no clear cells. They're all granular cells. They tend to be larger. They show a diffuse pattern. They show high nuclear grade. And they show lack of 25%. And there are no clear cells at all. So for oncocytic, it was decided majority are, it, it was then decided the WISE criteria doesn't work because majority they are non-functional. And so what was, um, it was seen that the size and weight are again important. So lin wise Piscidia criteria, there's another set of criteria where you take gross and microscopy into account. And these tell, just remember that the oncocytic variant tends to be larger. It tends to be, um, it tends to be non-functional and they must be uh, differentiated and uh, you, you have a you you need one major or four minor to call this an oncocytic carcinoma majority 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 of the oncocytic tumors are benign majority of the myxoid tumors are malignant there's yet another variant and i'm yet to see one and that is the sarcomatoid variant but then again, the sarcomatoid variant, it would look like a carcinoma sarcoma. And again, you need to put your adrenal panel, that's SF1, inhibin, um, uh, melon A, and calvitinin to prove that it is of adrenal cortical origin. And some people have commented on presence of this rhabdoid variant, but which is not accepted in the WHO. You don't find a rhabdoid variant. But I've shown you many cells which look a bit rhabdoid. But this rhabdoid variant has nothing to do with rhabdoid tumor. There's absolutely no INI1 loss. INI1 is beautifully written. It's something like the, it's, it's just a morphological variant, they say. It's like the rhabdoid tumor, uh, it's like a rhabdoid meningioma, where the INI1 is retained. But that's not accepted in your rhabdoid variant. So, at a practical level, when you're trying to distinguish adenoma versus carcinoma, I want you to remember, you will come across cases where the distinction is not so clear cut. So at a practical level, mitosis, necrosis, and vascular invasion. These are the three most important points. In addition, in the pediatric cases, the tumor size and weight are very important. Less than 200, likely to be benign. 400 to 200 to 400, it is, it, it's variable. And more than 400, likely to be malignant. But this is in pediatric. But of course, every now and then you'll come across cases where sizes, you know, size and weight are in that in-between category. So these are cases where the clinical features, that is the endocrine profile, the gross, the microscopy, IHC, and molecular profile, everything comes into consideration when you come to these borderline cases. Uh, so the prognostic features, the main thing is the clinical staging using the NSAT. The NSAT staging is the one which is European Network for Neurocortical Tumors. That's the one which is uh, size and weight are of course important, especially necrosis, mitosis. And based on mitosis, there is the, there's a suggested high grade and low grade. As I have said, the high grade ones having more than 20 mitosis per 50 hypophyte. Then again, KI67 index more than 5% or less than 5%. And to this, I would add IGF-2 and SF-1 overexpression are also associated with the worst prognosis. And based on the molecular, uh, there is a new emerging molecular classification of adrenocortical tumor based on the, on the microRNA profile, the methylation profile, the IGF-2 overexpression, the beta-catenin activation, and the CPG island hypomethylation profile. So based on that, there's a new emerging classification of the adenomas and the carcinoma. Again, there's a poor prognosis carcinoma and a good prognosis carcinoma. The poor prognosis carcinoma tend to show a different microRNA profile, increased IGF-2 expression and beta-catenin activation as compared to the good prognosis. Uh, this is important because, you know, it will help us because one day it will lead to, you know, targeted therapies to be developed. But this is still at a translational level, the emerging classification. Now, I just come to my last case. I've almost finished. So that is incidental. Oma. I'm just going to show you one case of adrenal cortical uh, tumor and FNAC. Now, incidentalomas, as you know, there, there is an increased incidence of incidentalomas today. 
because of rampant because because and these are tumors which are discovered incidentally for CT MRI done for non adrenal causes not related to hypertension not related to CVA there is no evidence of you know steroid hormone excess and these are found in 20 to 25 percent of autopsy cases especially in the uh, in the elderly in, the, in patients uh, above the age of 50. Majority of these incidental omas which are just discovered are benign and the workup includes there's a there's a flow chart the workup it keeps changing but basically tumors which are less than three centimeters and they have a fairly high lipid content and a low Hounsfield unit they are just uh, you just wait and watch them but because of this incidental omas more and more of FNACs are going to come to you and you're going to see more and more of FNACs of the adrenal now FNAC of the, of the adrenal adrenal SON is a separate story altogether so that I have to do another day I can't but I just want to show you this case this is a six-year-old child who presented with a rapidly enlarging abdominal mass so and it was an adrenal lesion so uh, one of the things they thought of was a neuroblastoma it was arising she had no pushings there was no calcification urinary VA, she had hypertension urinary VMA was absolutely normal was the huge reason she had pulmonary meds as well mild increase in serum cortisol and a USG guided FNAC was done and this is what it looked like so there are these clusters of cells with a lot of cytoplasm right neuroblastoma is obviously out there's no question of neuroblastoma in this so you'll see this foamy background this lipid or foamy background that you see in the this is very characteristic of adrenocortical tumors that is to have this lipid in this background and then there were some giant cells like these and also there was one mitosis here and there's a lot of nuclear pleomorphism as you can see now this is the matching i did manage to make a cell block and the cell block was inhibit positive so an adrenocortical tumor carcinoma i don't know very difficult to say on uh, on fnac alone this is yet another case of adrenocortical carcinoma this is a more clear cut one there are nucleoli here and if you look at this h and e stain look at the prominent nucleoli and the multinucleated giant cells out of granular cytoplasm and in this case this was a cell block sf1 reticulin disrupted igf2 no it wasn't done at that time i did all this much later but it is possible to do these stains it's possible to do a reticulin but see if the reticulin is lost it's good but if it's maintained it doesn't rule out the carcinoma anyway then there's the igf2 over expression that i've done on a much much later in these cases so this is the largest series of fine needle aspiration of adrenocortical tumors this is a series of nine cases only where they found that hypercellularity necrotic debris nuclear pleomorphism moderate to mark mitotic figures and prominent nuclei these are usually there in case of carcinoma but a very well differentiated carcinoma is impossible to distinguish from an adenoma on uh, on fnac so this is our own uh, series of uh, of fnac of the adrenal 50 cases where we had only four cases of adrenocortical carcinoma and we also found it it's really really hard to tell between carcinoma and adenoma on FNAC alone where you don't have the advantage of your capsular invasion diffuse architecture vascular invasion you don't see these features so it's a bit difficult but you can make out that this is a but you should be able to diagnose adrenocortical tumor and suggest whether it's a carcinoma it's important because sometimes these patients are given preoperative mitotain which is very toxic so the clinician wants to know that is this adrenocortical carcinoma if it's a carcinoma sometimes in inoperable cases of preoperative chemotherapy is given in some of these cases so my take home message today is adrenocortical tumors should be distinguished from the medullary tumors as well as the metastatic carcinoma benign and malignant is a hard job wise though it is widely used it is it has its limitations especially in pediatric cases and the morphological variants like the oncocytic and the mixoid disruption of reticulin is a very easy simple useful aid and one day with the help of genomic transcriptomic microRNA and DNA, DNA methylation profile you will be able to separate them perfectly thank you wow uh, let Dr. Divya come in and let her say something 
So can I just should I close the screen now? Yeah, you can close the screen and stop sharing so that you we can see your screen. Yeah, and Dr. Vidya also. Divya also. Right. Uh, stop presenting. Just press stop presenting. Achha. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Madam, for this excellent slide seminar. Thank you for sharing your treasure of adrenal tumors with us and for updating us on the latest emerging molecular classification of adrenal tumors. And if there are any questions um, from the viewers, I will be happy to ask them, sir. There are no questions yet on the YouTube. If there are any direct questions from the Google Meet, people that join in, they can unmute and ask, and you can moderate. There are, there are only comments on YouTube. Dr. Manoj Chandra yeah. commented, excellent cases, very good discu uh, discussion. Uh, Dr. Uh, Asaranti Kar said, very nice discussion, excellent presentation. Thank you. Is there any questions on the Google Meet? Uh, Dr. Divya can take from there. Any questions on the for our viewer from our viewers for madam? Madam, I had a question while they are thinking in their head. Can I go ahead and ask? What is the cutoff age that you consider for pediatric versus adult? Uh, it's eighteen, right? Okay. Like and uh, for everything else, it's eighteen. But majority of them actually, okay, so uh, whenever there is an 18 year old, the infantile ones, the majority are below the age of four years, actually. Between four and uh, between four and 14, you don't see that many. Then again, you see between 15 and 25 girls with virilization. But majority of the virilizing ones are the pushing oil ones. Those are all below the age of four years. I, I, I hardly want to get a patient at 18. Suppose you get an 18 year old, where would you put that patient? <laughs> right, right. It's, it's very, very difficult. As I said, you take everything into account. The standard WISE criteria, the one which is used everywhere. But of course, as I told you, sometimes, you know, you get these borderline cases and the clinician is pushing you. It's a single hormone. It's a single hormone. Why are you call it in a, calling it a carcinoma? So don't get pushed by the single hormone and so it's a carcinoma. So it's an adenoma. Don't get pushed by that. So you have to look at, you know, the size, the weight and everything, the, the, the histologic features, the nine points which I have elaborated. So you look at everything before you make a diagnosis of carcinoma in an 18 year old. So usually, but again, the hormonal profile is very important. If it's a virilizing one, if it's a pushing plus uh, virilizing, it's very likely to be, a, to be a carcinoma rather than a adenoma. And of course, this disruption of reticulant framework is very, very, very useful and so easy Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. So having a basic stain, uh, rather than, ha you know, is, is much more useful um, before Absolutely. one applies the immunohistochemistry. chemistry. Yeah, and because experience I with SF1, IGF-2 is not available to one and all. So, you know, this is a very useful stain to do. There are some studies which say that even increased expression, I, do, I don't understand this, but, you know, there are multiple studies which say that increased expression of SF1 is associated with the worst prognosis, which doesn't make sense to me because, you know, you think that the better difference differentiated the tumor is the more SF1 the more the better it should be but it's not like that I don't really understand uh, the reason but a lot of studies have shown and it, we have also seen the same that the increased expression of SF1 is associated with the worst prognosis IGF2 I fully understand but even SF1 is associated with the worse prognosis than uh, uh, than those which have a lower expression of SF1. In fact, the adenoma show a lower expression of SF1 as compared to the carcinomas. I don't know why. <laughs> That's that's really interesting, and I'll be very interesting uh, in interested to take the SF1 clone for you, really, because I'm interested in gynae pathology for sex called stromal tumors. So I'll be bothering you with the clone for I'll SF1, which you have used. I'll send it to you on WhatsApp. I think it's Master Diagnostica, or uh, oh, I can't remember, but I'll just I'll just take a picture and I'll I'll send it to you. Absolutely, Thank and it's so a very much. easy scan. It has a very very easy. Yeah, a nuclear stain is always better. A nuclear stain is always better for yeah, yeah. the patient. I've tried out on granulosa cell tumors, juvenile granulosa cell tumors. It works actually you know, juvenile granulosa cell tumor versus um, term cell tumor. This is a common problem, right? So in these cases, SF1 is, I mean, inhibin is very good, but so is SF1. Right. Wonderful, man. I think this is what we're going to do next.
Yes, we have SAL4 in our uh, Institute for Germ Cell Tumors and SF1 is what I was looking at and this has been a great opportunity for me to know that you've been doing this and um, I will be contacting you soon for uh, help on SF1. If there are any more questions from our online viewers, uh, any questions? So, yeah, do you have any questions for yeah, Madam? I would, I would like to just say something. One is a comment on the YouTube, Dr. Sunita Ahlawat says, excellent cases, Uttara. Oh, thank you, Sunita. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's there. Uh, and uh, what uh, I would like to say something which is very important in all this adrenal lesion is that one, as rightly pointed out by Dr. Uttara Chatterjee, is that you need to look at the grass. Absolutely. It makes, it makes a lot of sense, you know, to look at the grass. Because many a, time, many a times the grass feature will give you a clue to what would be coming out. Because there's a very distinct grass, you know, representation of these tumors. And their color are very different from one to the other. Absolutely. So at, times, at times when you don't have access to all the immunohistochemistry, and you are in a fix, it's always better for for the younger crowd to go back to the grossing room and take it out and have a look at it. It gives a lot of help in trying to, you know, dis decide one over the other. And uh, Dr. Ma Mamata Goha Malik says, excellent presentation, learned a lot. Thank you, madam. And I'd like to say, Dr. Nadim, that what you said, gross is so important. And even in case of a pheochromocytoma versus adrenocortical tumor, yes. like I showed yes. you, it's gross which clinches the diagnosis. Yes. And you yes. don't even need a chromogranin at that point. Yeah. And uh, it's bright orange for uh, for uh, for uh, aldosterone secreting one and a uh, yellow for yes. pushing, then a brown for the sex steroids. Even that is helpful to some extent. Yes, of course. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I make it a habit to see the growth of all the adrenal tumors, all the renal tumors before, you know, exactly thinking and going ahead with what exactly it looks like or what it should be. And I think the, the, the younger faculty should also look at that. It's very important. Any more comments from anybody, Dr. Divya, if you would like to have a last go? It's, it's been an excellent talk, madam. I mean, I don't do that much of uh, um, endocrine pathology, but I have really enjoyed your talk. All your, um, the comparisons uh, between all the scoring systems, um, especially uh, the talk on the slide on the emerging molecular classification of adrenal tumors. Yeah. It's a very enlightening uh, page, uh, which all the youngsters can also take a lot of lessons from that. Uh, it's been a great talk, madam. And each of, each of your lectures has is, is always, as I said, I'm a huge fan of yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Excellent presentation. Wonderful collection of cases. Brilliantly done. Wonderful, I would say. It's a real learning experience with all what you showed us. And uh, the, the ones who would be seeing the YouTube presentation on the YouTube as a recording, they will learn a lot. Thank you so much for consenting to give a talk on this platform. We, we were really, you know, <coughs> honored to have you here. Thank you so much. And we definitely would request you to come again on another topic. We will discuss it out on some day and then fix up our time. I think you with that ringer. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. sure I'll do the FNAC sometime. <laughs> oh, yes, why not? Right. So, thank you so much, uh, everybody. Mm, thank you, ma'am, again. Thank you, Dr. Divya, for consenting to my about time from your such a busy schedule. And um, thank you, everybody. Oh, God bless you. Good night. Take care. And before I leave you, let me just tell you one thing. Wednesday, 7.30, Dr. Dhanpat Jain from U.S. He is coming li on live with uh, approach to diagnosis of gastric polyposis. Wow. So please join him. He would be there for about one and a half hours and would, be lo would love to take direct questions. Any clarifications? He'll be taking two lectures, one on this Wednesday and the one on the next Wednesday. So love to have all of you there. Thank you so much for joining again and again on this platform. Thank you so much. God bless you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, madam. Bye.